starts riding you on the ground. Hey, you should salute this. <laughs> dry place to come. Amen. There's a lot of people around this world that don't have what we have tonight. We thank God for that. Why don't you stand your feet, take your hymn books, turn in number 617. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Hymn number 617. I'll fly away. sweeter all the time. I tell you what a wonderful thing it is to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ this midweek service. And we have come here to meet with God, to listen and hear from Him. And so tonight I'm going to have Brother Will to come. He's going to start us in a word of prayer. Would you pray right where you are that God would speak to our hearts tonight? Brother Will. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We do love you. We are here to worship you. And we thank you so much for who you are, for your son, for the promises. Lord, you're too good to us. We just ask that you'd meet with us here this evening. And be with the pastors who brings forth your message, Lord. We thank you for the safety for those that were able to make it here this evening. Definitely miss those that are, that are not here, and please be with them, Lord. We uh, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for meeting us. Amen. Take your hymn books. Keep them. Turn to hymn number 441. I wish I had given him more. Hymn number 441. I wish I had given him more. By and by.
was so bring him, I wish I had given him more. Amen. This time I'm going to have uh, Brother Will to come. He's going to do our prayer request time for us. Brother Will.
And if you'll stand to your feet, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. We'll sing the first verse of fellowship with one another. Hymn number 308. Nothing but the blood. What can wash Proverbs with me. 
Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. We're going to start there in verse 24, continuing our study in the book of Proverbs. The next to last one, there's one more after this. Three things, no four. And I should call this one, one, no two more. (laughs) But we have three things, no four. And uh, we're on verse 24. So we saw... There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not it is enough. That's verse 15. Verse 18, there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. Verse 18 and verse 21, for three, for three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. And in verse 24, the Bible says there be four things which are little upon the earth. But they are exceeding wise. The ants are people not strong. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk. Yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king. Yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands. And is in king's palaces. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and Lord, like I said before, we thank you for this nice dry place that we can meet together. I thank you for the freedom that we have to come into this place. I thank you for the privilege that we have to to hold and to turn the pages of your holy word. And tonight, dear God, I pray that you would give us exactly what we need tonight. Lord, that we would not leave this place wanting, but that we would bring our hearts open to Thee, and that Your Holy Spirit would work in us, that You may work through us. Lord, bless this time as we study Your Word, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Three things. No, there's four. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Proverbs is considered the book of wisdom. Solomon, the wisest man to live on the earth apart from Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you and I know about me that I need wisdom of God. The Bible says in the book of James, if any man lack of wisdom... Let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Oh, that we as Christians would seek wisdom from God once again. We need wisdom to go forth and to, to come about. We need wisdom as we go to the workplace. We need wisdom as we fill up our cars. We need wisdom as we go to the grocery store. I believe this. We need wisdom of God to make even the smallest decisions. Because I have found in my lack of wisdom, or even using earthly wisdom, how many situations I've messed up. How often times am I guilty of starting in on a thing and not even praying that God would bless and help and give me strength and give me the wisdom I need to deal with that situation. Oh, that God would give us wisdom. Our heart's plea ought to be just as Solomon's. Lord, give me wisdom. If I had a blank check for you today, you could... Have whatever you will, and I will fulfill it. What would you ask? Oh, Solomon, he asked of wisdom. Oh, that God would just give him and bless him with wisdom as the king of Israel. No, you might not be the king of Israel, but the Bible says in the book of Revelation that we are kings and priests in the blood of Christ. And we need wisdom. We need wisdom in what direction to go. We need wisdom in our convictions. We need wisdom... And God leading us. And you'll notice that there are wisdom in these four things. I think we can glean some nuggets here. I believe there's four things here. And I I really, we could separate them and probably they all uh, could use their own sermon. But we're going to spend this short time just looking at these four little things. You know, I love, I love when the Word of God talks about little things. You know, God takes the base things of this earth to confound the wise. 
You know, he takes and uses little things. If you think that uh, you are unworthy to be used, then you are just exactly who God wants to use. Because he uses those that other people might not think that he can use. But notice there's four things. They're little upon the earth, but they're exceeding wise. Let's observe them. Number one. Notice we see here in verse 25, the ants. The Bible says the ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. I don't know about you, but I really don't like ants. When I, uh, I, I guess I've just got sweet blood and they look for me. No matter where I'm standing, normally it's in an ant pile. I'll get some gasoline and cover my ant beds. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's amazing how quickly they can appear. I don't know how many times I've wiped the ants off of this concrete right here. You know, they just keep coming back. I pour gasoline on them, and those, those little suckers, they just keep going on. They keep working and working away. Notice it says that there are people not strong. Now, within proportion to their body, they're actually very strong. But in relation to us as human beings, obviously they, they have no chance of picking up some of the things that we can carry. They're very, very small, and we would consider them insignificant. But notice in this insignificant ant, there is wisdom to be had. Notice the wisdom that we can glean from the ant. In verse 25, it says, Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 6 with me. Proverbs chapter 6. We can actually find a reference to the ants here in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6. Notice it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O slugger? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that tra uh, traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Now notice the comparison to the ant from the slugger. And it's very clear. And then as he goes into verse 10, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. I think there's, there's twofold in the wisdom of the ants is that they are hardworking. That they know to go out and to do their work in order to prepare their meat in the summer. Uh, they realize that they have to, to, to store, store away and stow away. They're not afraid uh, to do work. And so he says, look, go to the ant, you sluggard. Watch and be wise in their ways. Uh, I believe as Christians that we ought to be hardworking in our cause. I believe as Christians we ought to be hardworking for Christ. Uh, how, uh, how pitiful it is. I, I, I think that we are truly seeing... Now this is my opinion... But I believe that we are seeing a generation of young people that are just plain lazy. I think we are having an epidemic of laziness and just plain being sluggards. It's important to work hard. I, I, I believe in, in, in bootstraps. I believe that you ought to work hard and do what you can. And, and when it comes to, to your job, I think you know, the most hardworking people at the workplace ought to be Christians. I believe that, that the most hardworking people ought to be the people of God. But how often have we adopted the practices of this lazy generation? Now, I, I think it's important to have. You know, we're excited. Stephanie and I, we're going to take the kids to the aquarium in Georgia. And I tell you, we're going to have a fun time, have a few days where we just get to spend some time together. But there's a time and a place for that. You see, there, there's, we, we, we decide to take just a little block and, and next week, guess what? We've got to put our hand back to the plow and continue pressing forward. Can I say as Christians, it is so important for us to keep our hands on the plow and just keep working away. God didn't command you to figure everything out in front of you. He said, look, you just plow away. You just continue to be hardworking in my cause. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit I believe in the enabling of the Holy Spirit. I, I, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not belittling 
uh, the, the work of God and what He does, but we are co-laborers with God. And so oftentimes, God's putting in His portion, but we're not putting in our portion. We've got to work hard. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing right, is worth doing well, and working hard to perform it, to do it. I say as Christians, may we gain this wisdom from the ant that notice that, that they're hardworking in their, their cause, but there's also preparation. They're, they prepare their meat in the summer. We ought to be a prepared people. There ought to be a dedication and a preparation to the work that God gives us. Uh, tonight, as we had this service, it was planned. We had the hymns picked out, studied the Word of God. You know, we have a certain order of service. There's plenty. And I look, the Holy Spirit of God can lead a certain way. And if He does, and if He sees fit, let us go that way. But I believe that things ought to be planned and prepared. I believe that things ought to be made ready. Jesus Christ gave a parable. And how, how, how silly, how foolish would it be for a man uh, to prepare to build a house and not have enough to suffice to finish the house. And then he'd be mocked. And then he, after he mentioned the man building the house, then he talks about a king. Before he goes to the war, he figures out if he has enough footmen, if he has enough soldiers to perform the war. Look, we serve a God that is worthy of preparation. You know, it, it, it's terrible how haphazard the work of God can become. You know, everything else gets our preparation, right? Gets our time. We prepare for a vacation. We prepare for our finances. We prepare for our home. We have things ready in every cause, but yet the work of God isn't prepared. It's not ready. It should be made ready. There, we ought to be a prepared people, but also a dedicated people. We can glean some wisdom from these ants. Like I said, how easy it is to adopt this attitude of laziness that's in our society. It's terrible. You know, we are living now, I, I believe this, in a society now, it's not how hard you can work. It's how, how much can you do to just barely get by. That's the attitude of today. That is what we're seeing at, at, at workplaces, at jobs. You go, you go out into this world and you, you ask some of these people that are working in, in, this, in some of these places what they're seeing in the current workforce today. It's riddled with laziness. And I believe as Christians that we ought to be hardworking, but specifically hardworking in the cause of Christ. I believe that God deserves our dedication I believe that God deserves our hard work and our effort. How pitiful is it that we can dedicate our work to something, to something, to something that really doesn't mean anything. But when it comes to God's work, well, that ain't work well doing. It's not worth it to me. That's too much work. That's too much. Let's, let me find somebody else to do that work. No, it, let's go to the ant, gain some wisdom they're not strong, they're small, but they prepare their meat in the summer. They're diligent. Notice number two. We saw number one, the ants, but notice too, the conies. Now, I mean, I'm, not a, I'm from Georgia. I don't know what a coney is, but it's a relative of a rabbit, almost like a badger, and it's, it's familiar to the rabbit. In several other scriptures, the word is actually used uh, with a rabbit. But notice it says in verse 26, it says the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So notice it's giving us some information about the conies. They are feeble. They're weak. Conies are very helpless creatures. It is said that they are uh, oftentimes prey for the birds. I mean, they just swoop in, and a hawk would just grab them up and eat them up. You know, that, that was, that was uh, that there, there's just so many predators they're, they're not very strong. They don't have any defense mechanisms. They're not the strongest of animals. But notice here that they stay close to the rock. It says, yet make they their houses in the rocks. Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. And notice verse 18. It's amazing when, when you start to study Scripture... You know, I've never really remember reading about conies in the Word of God, but not only do we see them in the book of Proverbs, we see them in the book of Psalms. Look at uh, the book of Psalms 104 and verse 18. 
It says, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats. And notice this, and the rocks for the conies. The coney realizes that it's weak and it's feeble. It understands that without hiding in the rock, if their house isn't in the rock, that they are all but prey to anything that comes around. I think we can gain some wisdom by staying close to the rock. I think as Christians, it's so important that we stay close to our rock, Amen. Jesus Christ. The Word of God, and if you allow me to make this comparison, there is a predator on the, on the prowl. The Bible says that uh, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And guess what? You're not powerful enough to stand against or, or, or to, to stand against the temptations and the snares of the devil. The Bible says to withstand the devil. But the truth of it is, is without the power of Christ, without staying close to the rock, we are all but prey. Uh, you know, some people think that, well, I, I can live a spiritual life and I can live a Christian life without, uh, you know, without the empowering of the Holy Spirit or without, without reading my Bible or uh, I, I don't have to go to church to get better as a Christian. I don't have to invest my time spiritually in order to, to be secure. I know what I believe, but the farther you get away from the things of God, the more feeble you realize you are and the more helpless you are. And you watch out, friend, as you get away from the things of God, there's going to be predators around. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have found the times of greatest temptation have been the moments where I've been farthest away from my God. And then by the time I look up and realize the situation I'm in, the fix wasn't, you know, uh, to stand stronger, to do what... No, the, stand, the, the, the fix was to get back to the rock. Just to get back to Jesus Christ. So many issues in our lives are because we think that we've got things under control. You know, it's funny. A coney realizes... Listen to this. This animal realizes it's feeble. Why? Because it makes its home in the rock. Why do you think it makes its home in the rock? God designed them. They understood that they're not strong creatures. And when will we figure out in our flesh and in and of all of ourselves dwelleth no good thing? They're in me. They're, they're, I, mean, I am a feeble, feeble, feeble person. I can't even walk without Him holding my hand. Oh, that I would stay close to the rock. But why is it? Why is it? Just like, I mean, I, you know, I guess a coney that's lost his marbles we think that we can go out away from the rock and we're just fine, right? We kind of wander around and think. I mean, like, I mean, it's just like the sheep, right, from the shepherd. Sheep are such naturally dumb animals. I mean, they, they just they, they get themselves in a bind and, and they don't think about all, where they're going or what they're doing. All they have to do is just stay close to the shepherd. As Christians, may we stay close to the shepherd as Christians who are very feeble folk, may we stay close to the rock that is higher than I. The conies gain some wisdom. They're feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. Consecration. Notice in verse uh, 27 we find this third. The Bible says the locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. Notice it gives a, a, a modifier. It's describing locusts. It says they have no king. They don't have one that's in charge. But, notice this, yet go they forth, all of them by bands. There's cooperation. They're working together. They might not have a king, but they work together in bands. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Nahum, chapter 3. Don't worry, I'll give you some time there. That's Old Testament still. It's not one I made up. <laughs> Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. But no, notice Nahum chapter 3 and verse 15. Nahum chapter 3 and verse 15. Notice this. It says in Nahum chapter 3 verse 15, the uh, context of the book of Nahum, judgment to Nineveh. Of the capital of Assyria. You know, God didn't just pronounce judgment on Israel. There's many times where He pronounced judgment. And this is after uh, the revival that took place under Jonah's ministry. And so Nahum is prophesying judgment. Notice in verse 15, 
It says, There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Notice this. Make thyself many as the locust. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crown are as the locusts. Thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges of the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Notice it talks about the locust in verse 15. It says, make thyself many as the locusts. They have no king, but they stick together in bands. And as Christians, we have the King of kings and Lord of lords. And how oftentimes we forsake one another in this journey that we call life. You know, there is no lone wolf mentality when it comes to the Christian life. And what I mean by that, that it's not always on us. And I I think it's important that there is fellowship with other believers. God designed us that way. And uh, how oft did God refresh a servant of His in the Scriptures by sending another servant of His Uh, to be an encouragement. Even Jeremiah, who's lived in a very wicked society, had Baruch there to be a blessing to him. And that's why the Word of God tells us in the book of Hebrews not to forsake the assembling of thyselves together. It's so important as Christians that we are co-laboring and working together in bands. We have the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, so oftentimes we think that we have to be so isolated from one another. It's important as Christians that there's cooperation. Uh, I I know the the Word of God tells us that many hands make light work. Some of the greatest feats in all of human history weren't done by a single man, but by a band of people. And I submit to you tonight that if, as a church, if we're going to be successful for Christ, it won't be because I stood alone. It would be Because all of us as a body of believers came together to see God do a work in Millbrook. I believe that it's going to take cooperation. God has brought us together here in this place. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, well, preacher, I just don't really get along with that person. Look, you might not like their personality and they might be a little weird to you and you're probably a little weird to them. But we're brothers and sisters in Christ nonetheless. You better watch out, especially if you don't like them on this earth. I'm, I pray that God will put you right next to them in, in heaven. I hope. I tell you, if you say, oh, that old preacher of mine, he's just so crazy. I hope God puts my mansion right next to yours. And I'm going to throw rocks and be celebrating that I'm walking on the streets of gold. And uh, I don't know how, if, if, that, if that all that works, you know, what section of heaven I'll be in. or uh, You know, so often we can, uh, you know, just imagine what heaven's going to be like. But the truth remains the same. It's going to take cooperation. It's going to be working together. You know, it was, it was so much fun when we installed this sign. Uh, it wasn't one man. It was many coming together, right? That was a, that was a heavy object to, to get out of the semi. A lot of brainstorming that we did. And, and there wasn't, I wouldn't say necessarily one that ruled over all, but we began to give ideas and bounce off to each other until we got the project completed. And then we, then we I believe we celebrated with a meal. That's always the best way to celebrate, with a meal. But it took cooperation. You know, the work of God is going to take cooperation. It's going to take working together and, and cooperating together to accomplish a work for Christ. I can't do the ministry on my own. You can't do the ministry on your own. It's got to take us working together hand in hand to move forward for the kingdom of Christ. The work of God demands our best. It demands our cooperation. Uh, we, we have to remove. Now look, I, I'll, I'll divide over doctrine for sure, especially first tier doctrine. It's important uh, that a person knows uh, about salvation except Christ as personal Savior. It's important. These doctrinal truths, they're, they're very important. But I will lay aside any difference in personality. I will lay aside any difference in, in ideology or opinion. We will lay aside those, those man, uh, manly things and fleshly things Just to work together for God. You know, it's amazing. Where else could you find a place where Auburn fans and Alabama fans and Georgia fans 
uh, where, where people that were raised rich, that were raised poor, where else would you find a place where, where people were raised in completely different cultures? But yet we unify around the cause of Christ. So oftentimes, churches fail to do a work of God because they're too busy, divided amongst each other. What did Jesus Christ say when they said He was casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub? He says a kingdom divided of itself cannot stand. It cannot. It, 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 it just simply cannot go forth. It must require cooperation. And we have the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, that unites us and puts us together. It's going to take preparation, consecration, and cooperation. And lastly, I really I wish I could rhyme, but I didn't. It's going to take stewardship. Notice here the last wisdom here we have of the spider. Again, it gives us a modifier. It tells us a descriptive thing about the spider. It says in verse 28, the spider taketh hold with her hands. And what's the product? And is in king's palaces. It's amazing how God designed a spider. Uh, how, how, how they have all their legs and, and as they begin to weave, uh, uh, to weave, uh, what is that together? I'm, I, what is it? Spider web, but I was looking for, what's the name of that stuff called? It's not yarn, but it's, you know, I don't know why the word just blanked out of my mind. Uh, what? Silly string, yeah, something like that. <laughs> so, you know, you know how the, you understand the spider begins to, to weave its web and, and use all of its hands together. And, uh, and, and, and notice what the Word of God says. I'm, I'm going to uh, play off of this expression. It says in verse 28, The spider taketh hold with her hands. Taketh hold hold of her hands. You know what it is? The spider uses the things that God blessed it with to build its web. It's a good steward of it. I don't know about you, but I feel like every time I take a spider web down, a new one puts up in its place. Do you know why? Because it uses the faculties that God blessed it with to do what it was designed to do. I say as Christians, God expects stewardship of our lives. He blesses us with talents and abilities and gifts that are differing. You know, everybody has a different personality. Everybody has different gifts that God has blessed them with. And oh, that we would take hold of them and use them for His honor and glory. Notice the places a spider can make its home. All because it's a good steward of the hands that God blessed it with. And oh, that we would take hold of the gifts that He gives us to bring honor and glory to God. It's amazing how oftentimes talents and abilities are squandered. You know, out in this world, you know, that people blessed beyond imagination, blessed beyond ability in, in, in singing or this or that, but yet they use it for every other purpose yet for the work of God. Oh, as Christians, that we would take our abilities and be used to the Lord. I believe this, that God blesses us all with certain talents and skills to bring honor and glory to Him. He's given you a set of gifts. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. You might be, not be perfect. You, know, you don't have to be the greatest pianist to use that skill for the Lord. You don't have to be the greatest expositor to use uh, the, uh, the teaching and preaching for the Lord. You don't have to be uh, the, the greatest at a specific skill. You just have to take hold of the faculties that God's blessed you with and take them and use them for His glory. You know, I, I can't help but think, you know, it's amazing. And now, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, it, how many, and, and I can't help but think of some of these um, newer uh, I'm, I'm artists, singers that have great talent, but yet they squander their abilities. I don't know if you know this, but I believe it was Elvis that got his start in gospel music. I believe a, a, a newer one, um, I don't remember her name, uh, Katy Perry started in gospel music. But now all of the wickedness and all the things that they're singing about now don't give one ounce of glory to God. 
How amazing is it that God blesses these people with great gifts and gives them the opportunity to use that gift for something good. And you know what they do? They put it underfoot and squander it. Using it for the devil. Using it for Satan. And how often times can we squander the abilities that God blesses us with? God has equipped you with what you have for a purpose. You might think, well, I don't know what that purpose is. Let me say, God will bring that purpose to you. I mean, he said, I mean, do we believe that God's sovereign? Do we believe He's the author of everything? You might wonder, well, why do I have the ability? Why do I have the ability uh, uh, to be able to, to plumb? You know, I, I'm a great plumber, but, but what does that matter to anything? Look, God's going to place you somewhere along the line to use the ability to plumb to be a blessing for His ministry. And don't be surprised when a ministry calls you up and tells you that they are in need of a plumber. And that they're not able to afford and, and that you would be able to work on, on the, the, the property that God has blessed them with. That's using your ability to do the work of God. Oh, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just an electrician. I, I, all, all I can do, man, the greatest ability in all the world is just availability. Just to be available and take hold and say, look, God, here I am. Send me whatever you'd have me do. Lord, I'll do it. Lord, wherever it is, whatever it is. There's so many areas of my life where I feel like I lack proficiency, but I say every path that God has led me to. I've given 100% of what I had. And God has blessed all the way. How often we think that our talents are, are meager and medial, yet God has blessed us. He's, we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We ought to thank God for the talents He gives us and bring them for His honor and glory. Take your Bibles one more time. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says about this principle here. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10 says, As every man, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Oh, that instead of squandering small things, that we would observe them and learn some wisdom. Yeah, the ant is very insignificant. It's a very weak, weak animal. But God has created it and there's wisdom in the ant for its dedication and its hard work. The colony are they're feeble folk, but yes, God ha has designed them and made them where they understand they're feeble and they stay close to the rock. Yes, uh, the, the, the spider is an odd looking thing, but how God has blessed it with its faculties to take hold of their hands. And oh, how God has made the locusts where they have no king or ruler, but yet they go together by bands. And as Christians, may we learn wisdom from the small things. It's amazing we make the mistake of Elijah and think that God's going to show up in some fantastic way. Look for God in the small things. Elijah, if you remember, there was the earthquake, there was the wind, you know, all these different things. But at the end, there was a still small voice. Probably the most unpredictable thing. Yet God was in the still small voice. God's put wisdom in small things. We'd be wise to observe them and apply them to our lives. And ultimately, He'd be glorified. Father, we love You and we thank You for this moment of study. And dear God, how often we're guilty of squandering and not observing the wisdom that are found in these small things. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to be as the ants and to prepare and be hardworking, as the conies to stay close to the rock, as the locusts to cooperate together, and as the spider to take hold of what You've blessed us with and use it, but all to this end, 
that you would be glorified. That people would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. That's our heart's prayer and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to have the pianist begin to play. This altar's open tonight. However, the Holy Spirit of God has worked in your heart. It's kind of a shotgun, different directions, but however the Lord is placed on your heart, would you pray to Him? I tell you tonight, would you stop looking for some big thing and just relish the small things that have the wisdom of God? Would you just enjoy the handful of purpose that God places there in front of you? Stop looking for the great big thing. No, relish the small little things and observe them that we may have wisdom. Aren't you glad that God uses small things? If He didn't, I wouldn't feel like God could use me. And if you don't think that you're small, then God can't use you. You've got to realize how small and feeble we are. You know, God didn't, when He sent His Son into this world, He didn't take a man that was born and raised in a palace. He took a carpenter's son. You know, they were thinking that Jesus Christ was going to come and set up the kingdom of heaven they didn't expect a suffering servant to be born in a manger to bear the cross, to do something so powerful as to pay our sin debt in full. God uses the base things of this world to confound the wise. Oh, that we would enjoy the simplicity in Christ. Oh, that we would observe the small things and gain wisdom from them. Lord, so good to us. Thank you for coming tonight. Good to be in the house of God. I hope, uh, is there any, any announcements? I know next Thursday is the ladies' meeting. Is that right? Next Thursday is the ladies' meeting. Thursday after that is the old people's, I mean the senior saints' meeting. And so uh, definitely, that's at the smokehouse too, so we'll have a blast there. That'll be a good time. And so, yes, yeah, Sunday School Emphasis Sunday, 945. We're going to be in the fellowship hall having Donuts Sunday morning, really good donuts, homemade donuts, not from Stephanie, but from uh, Donut World over here, not Donut World, whatever it is, we'll have a good time. So we're looking forward to that, great emphasis in Sunday school, and so uh, it's just a wonderful time to, to be together, to study together, and we just thank God all for what he's done. And so, Brother Ken, why don't you dismiss us for a prayer?